Hey, and welcome to the short stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck. This is short stuff. Yeah, that's right. What were you gonna say? I was I saying, yeah, off. I was wrapping up my <laughs> so, my little song. Oh man, can we start over? Sure. All right. Hey, everybody, welcome to short stuff. I'm Chuck. Hey, wait a minute. This is going wrong already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're here to talk about uh, red snow, and this. Uh, uh, the origin material here was from our old friends at HowStuffWorks.com and mm -hmm. Mark Mancini good, uh, with good his article. article, The Amazing and Alarming Science Behind Red Snow. Yes, because snow is not supposed to be red. And when the snow turns red, you know things have gotten biblical. I thought you were about to say like a a rhyming I could have. I chose term. not to specifically. When the snow turns red, that means you're not going to enjoy the future. <laughs> it's kind of what that means. I thought it was great. Mark Mancini went to the trouble of saying like, okay, snow's normally white and here's why. And I feel yeah. like we should honor his work by mentioning it to you. Let's hear it. Why is it white? Oh, because the crystals that make up ice or snow um, scatter all colors on the visible wavelength. So everything's reflected back as just white because they all mix together. No color right. gets absorbed, and see, so the snow doesn't seem like blue or red normally. It can turn red, and it's actually, we've known it turns red once in a while for a very long time. This is news to me, but apparently as far back as Pliny the Elder. Oh, uh, him again. Yeah, I love that guy. He was writing from 23 to 79 CE, um, and he wrote about red tin and snow as well. Yeah, I mean, Pliny the Elder wrote about red snow. I think in the in the Middle Ages, there were people talking about red snow. Sure. Um, there's a guy named Randall Cerveni, who it looks like uh, Mark might have actually interviewed for this article. Um, and this uh, Randall wrote a book uh, as a professor at Arizona State University called Freaks of the Storm, right. uh, which is about kind of wacky weather. And there was a, a chapter on red snow. And he said, you know, Charles Darwin saw red snow and the Andes mountains. Uh, it was white and when it turned red as it thawed. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of like very famous people in history have been kind of freaked out by seeing this uh, phenomenon. I don't know at what point we figured this out, but apparently by the time Darwin was around in the mid 19th century and seeing red snow in the Andes, um, he knew what it was. So it, like at least by the mid 19th century, we knew that red snow, it turns out, is actually caused by green algae, of all things. Yeah, and that's, you know, we'll get in after the jump to exactly what's going on there. Mm -hmm. It can also, you can get like reddish, pinkish hues if like Saharan dust blows like into Europe or something like yeah. that. Um, that's not the kind of red snow we're talking about. Right. Uh, we're talking about, and if you see pictures of like legit, red snow and as it melts red water flows and waterfalls all over the world and like you said it's green algae uh, specifically uh clamidominus nivalis very nice i practiced it too i think you nailed it let's hear your version uh clamidinus nivalis <laughs> it sounds like we both just cast a magic spell either way though i love latin for that reason all right, well, let's take an early break okay. since that's a pseudo cliffhanger. Maybe that's we'll, what we just conjured was a break. <laughs> and we'll tell you all about uh, how green algae can turn white snow red right after this. Okay, so Clamidomonas, Clamidomonas, yeah, Nivalis is a type of green algae, like we said, but we've been talking about red snow. And the reason, um, well, if, let me tell you a little bit more about this green algae first before Let's hear we it. get into why. It's, I've seen it written about as a cryophilic microeukaryote, mm. uh, meaning it loves the cold and it's a very tiny eukaryote. <laughs> Uh, it's like La Nina means the Nina. Right. <laughs> it's from Kingdom Plantae. It's a plant, but it's also mobile. It's very, mm -hmm. very bizarre. 
uh, in no small part because, again, it's green, um, but it, and it's a plant, but it lives in high-altitude snowfields like the Arctic or in the Andes Mountains. And um, it's green, but it produces a red pigment called astaxanthin uh, during warm seasons. And here's the crux of everything. If green algae didn't produce astaxanthin, we probably would not be talking about it right now. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, this stuff is pretty interesting. There's a biologist named Arwen Edwards, uh, who I think was also interviewed for this article, mm-hmm. who says that this red, red pigment acts kind of like a sunscreen. Yeah. Uh, it helps protect the organisms from excessive solar radiation uh, during the warm seasons. And so what happens is during the wintertime, these organisms go dormant. Yep. Uh, spring springs. And then they come to the surface and bloom. But, you know, it can't just bloom as in snow like algae needs um like liquid water to to bloom so as the snow melts it becomes more of that sort of wet snow Mm -hmm. and that's when the algae really starts blooming in the wet snow those algal cells get going yep and they photosynthesize and this is where that red pigment comes about yeah, and so if you get a bunch of these things together, and a lot of them can get together, a, a single millimeter of snow, I guess a cubic millimeter, can contain half a million in, of these individuals. So there's a lot of them, and when you put a lot of them together, the snow turns red. And not just like, oh, it looks kind of reddish, especially when it melts. It is like a puddle of blood, it looks like, basically. Semi-translucent blood. It's that red. It's pretty cool looking, in other words. Yeah. And there's a problem, though, with it turning red. Because, like you said, it needs a little bit of melted snow to um, start to, to bloom, to make it to the surface and start to thrive. But after it gets that initial foothold, it kind of takes over itself. Yeah. Because that red pigment... Um, absorbs way more solar radiation than white snow. White snow reflects everything, right? So white snow can stay colder longer. If you've ever seen a snow pile that got put in the corner of a parking lot in the Midwest or North and is still there in like May, that's because that, that snow is reflecting back all of that solar radiation or a lot of it. If that was red, it'd be melted by February. That's the saying. Um, and this stuff is red. So the more it blooms, the more it absorbs heat, the more it warms the surrounding snow, the more the snow melts. Yeah. I mean, that that white car that you have is going to be less hot than your red car and certainly your black car. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why you see so many white cars in the hot uh, places with a hot climate, like out in the desert. And it's the same deal here. So as the stuff uh, turns red, like you said, it sort of becomes a, a cycle uh, a feedback loop where it starts melting more and more stuff. Mm-hmm. And then that in turn, you know, can spread the algae. Right. And all of a sudden you might have a legit problem on your hands and nature magazine thinks that's the case in 2016. They published a report uh, under the leadership of Stephanie Lutz, uh, I believe from the university of Leeds. And they're basically saying, Hey, um, there's about a five to 15% acceleration of glacier melting rates because of this algae on the surface because it's darker. Yeah, and we should say this is not some new freak of nature. Like, this has always been going on. The reason that it's alarming, according to that 2016 paper from Nature, is that, like you just said, they're accelerating snow melt. And because global temperatures are warming and Arctic snow melt is really important to climate change in general— they're saying, like, we need to take this this into effect when we start making our climate models for glacial melting. And no one has until, or no one did until 2016. But their paper was so essentially irrefutable. They, they did exactly what they set out to do. Now people start to uh, um, include red snow blooms into uh, climate models. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of that simple. It it's, is that it's, simple. it's speeding things up. And they're including it in those models because it's that that feedback loop is happening and you can't just you you have to include all the variables. And this is officially counts as a variable. Yes. So, yeah, you couldn't make a prediction of like what kind of glacial melt you're going to see as the temperature warms without taking that into account. It might they might melt way faster, 15 percent faster than you would account for. And your seawall wouldn't be built in time. So T.S. for you, you should have taken red snow into account. 
That's right. Uh, one final little button on this. Uh, thanks to Mr. Mancini, we now have learned that apparently this uh, algae smells like watermelon. Mm-hmm. Um, I think who they interviewed said that they didn't uh, smell it themselves, but there are people that have reported this red pigment um, off gases a watermelony like smell. Yes, but Mark Mancini warns don't eat it. Nah. Apparently, the people have eaten it and have blamed red snow for gastric problems, and that's just not correct. It's probably something else in the snow, but don't eat it anyway. Yeah, don't eat the yellow snow. That's what Frank Zappa said. <laughs> yeah. And don't eat the red snow because uh, we told you by way of our friends at HowStuffWorks.com. That's the Chuck Bryant corollary. That's right. Uh, well, Chuck said that's right, everybody. That means short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.